Well, this morning, I've already told you we're going to be looking at a a very familiar passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 6, from which the uh, hymn that we sang earlier comes from, Holy, 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 and this is when uh, Isaiah was lifted up into the throne room of God and he saw God. And what what I'd like to consider uh, from this particular passage is what kind of effect that can have on us. Now, we know that There's perhaps many reasons uh, why when we see God, we're going to be humbled. Certainly, we're humbled by His greatness, His power, the expression, as it were, the effulgence of His glory. Uh, It would be a a very awful, awesome sight to see the Lord. Uh, Certainly, we're humbled by His grace and mercy. But one of the things I think that humbles us more than anything else is His holiness. And I believe that is the main effect that it had upon Isaiah because of what it is he expresses when he sees the Lord. So we we might certainly understand that he was humbled for many things, but what I want us to focus on particularly uh, this morning is being humbled by his holiness. So let me go ahead and read for you uh, this account in Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 13, and we're going to focus primarily upon what he says in verse 5. We read beginning in verse 1, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. He said, Go and tell this people. Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitants, houses are without people, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet there will be a tenth portion in it, And it will again be subject to burning like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. May the Lord bless his word uh, to our understanding and to our edification, our building up in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Now, we've seen in our text that in the year that King Uzziah uh, died, that Isaiah was lifted up into God's throne room in order to hear his word. Um, We understand that the prophets were those who were blessed uh, to enter into the the counsel of the Lord, into his council chambers in order to receive his message in order that they might declare it. Here we see Isaiah uh, entering into that very thing in order that he might be prepared by the Lord, that he might send him as a messenger to his people. And we see that here, Isaiah not only heard the word of the Lord, but he also saw him. Uh, He saw him in the way that the Lord is pleased to reveal himself in in the form of a man. And we know that throughout Scripture, this is how the Lord often appeared to his people. 
uh, in a way that they could relate. We know that God himself is, is an infinite, eternal, uh, unchangeable spirit. He is also invisible to the eye. And of course, if he were to appear in, in that way, then it wouldn't uh, perhaps have much significance or meaning to uh, Isaiah. There has to be some sort of visible manifestation. And as I've said, the Lord accommodates us. He, uh, as it were, descends to our weakness. And he appears in a way that we can relate to, in a way that we can understand. We see other examples of this in Scripture, such as in Exodus 24, verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord went up with Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. So he appears again in a human form. It says that he has feet, and he is, the feet are resting on what appears to be a pavement of sapphire. When the Lord comes as the angel of the Lord, he appears in the form of man. He came to Abraham when Abraham was praying to the Lord, asking for mercy for Lot just before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He appeared in the form of a man when he wrestled with Jacob, as Jacob wrestled with him for the blessing which we've just seen he had promised to him when he stood, as it were, at the top of that ladder. And of course, he also appeared in the form of a man when he appeared to Joshua with his sword drawn as the captain of the Lord's hosts, in each of these cases reminding them that the Lord is with them. Now here's something that's interesting that I've already mentioned, but I think something we need to understand here. I think we should assume that whenever the Lord appears in this way, and actually it's likely when He appears in any way, that it wasn't the Father that was appearing, but rather it was the second person or the eternal Son of God that was appearing uh, to man. And I think we should assume this because it's certainly through the Son that the Father uh, deals with fallen humanity. You know, Jesus is the one who comes into the world to reveal the Father. And I believe he was doing that uh, even before he was incarnate. Uh, John also tells us something which helps us to understand this in John 1.18 when he says, no one has seen God, and perhaps he means here the Father, at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, that is the Son of God, he has explained him, or he is the one who has revealed him. Now, John actually goes on to tell us in his gospel that this one that Isaiah saw seated on the throne in, in all of this glory and splendor was none other than the Son of God himself. He writes in John 12, verses 37 through 41, and I want you to notice that he is talking about this, this very event that we've just read about in Isaiah 6. He says, but though he, that is Jesus, had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their hearts so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Now, I want you to notice this is reflecting the same language that the Lord spoke to Isaiah when he says, I'm sending you to a people and you're going to speak to them, but I want you to know that they are not going to understand and they are not going to receive because... He says, basically, he is hardening their hearts and he is blinding their eyes as an act of judgment against them. But, but again, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory, that is the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he spoke of him. This one Isaiah saw was the Lord Jesus Christ seated on the throne. This is pre-incarnate, so this is the eternal Son of God. But I want you to notice, too, that Isaiah didn't just see his human form. He also saw his glory. The Lord was high and lifted up. I mean, he is the eternal Son of God. 
He was seated on his throne. He is eternally the one who reigns over all things. His train, that is the glorious light that was all around him, filled the temple. The seraphim who are called the guardians of God's holiness surrounded him, flying around him, and they were worshiping him. They were shielding their faces from the glory that was shining from him. They were covering their feet to show their humility. One of them was crying out to the other, or perhaps they were all speaking the same thing. Verse 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory with a voice that was so loud that it made the, the very thresholds shake. And we read also that as they spoke, the, the cloud or the smoke filled the temple by which we should understand that glory cloud by which the Lord reveals something of his glory. But the important thing I want us to notice here is how Isaiah responded when he saw this vision. He cries out again in verse 5 of our text, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, it was at that moment that Isaiah understood something of his own condition before the Lord, that he would have been destroyed by the presence of the Lord except for God's mercy. Remember what God said to Moses in Exodus 33, 20, no man can see me and live. When Isaiah saw the Lord, it was perhaps for the first time he actually saw himself as he really was before him. Now, it's really that that I want us to focus on this morning. I want us to focus on what it is that we should see when we see the Lord. We see what we really are outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to see, secondly, that it's really good for us to see this about ourselves because of its effects. And then, thirdly, I want us to look at how it is we can see the Lord because really very few people have ever had this privilege of being lifted up into the throne room of God. How can we see the Lord so that we can see ourselves as we really should? So first of all, let's consider that it's when we see the Lord that we see what we really are. Uh, one of the ways that um, I think we understand that we grow as Christians is by making comparisons. You know, we compare ourselves with others. Uh, role models are, are really very important to us. As a matter of fact, um, Paul uh, used himself as a role model, and he even pointed to others who were following the same example that he believed that they should follow. He pointed to them also as examples that the Philippians should follow. He says in Philippians 3, verse 17, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Okay? Examples are important because when we see them, we, we automatically see certain things we appreciate. We compare what we're doing to what they're doing, and then we perhaps correct ourselves if we need to. I mean, one of the reasons why we enjoy reading biographies, but particularly those that the Lord used so powerfully in the history of the church, is because we're hoping that through their examples, will be encouraged to walk the Christian walk. I mean, hasn't it had that effect upon you? It certainly has upon me. But you see, if we never look beyond those examples, we're not really going far enough. I mean, what if we did reach the example of those that we admire the most? I mean, we, maybe we admire Spurgeon. What if we could attain to his level of holiness or perfection, or maybe that of Whitfield or Edwards? You know, that's... I think those are, again, good examples perhaps to aspire after. If we do happen to arrive at where they're at, have we gone far enough? Well, the Bible tells us we haven't. Jesus tells us the standard is not those examples, but rather that that God gives us. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And really, Spurgeon, Whitfield, and Edwards, for all that they had attained, 
none of them reached perfection in and of themselves. Uh, we have not reached that perfection. Um, we certainly realize that we haven't when we see the Lord. By the way, I, I told you Jacob saw the Lord. I told you Isaiah saw the Lord. There was another man who saw the Lord, and it had virtually the same effect upon him. If, if we were to think about the Old Testament and we were to pick out perhaps different individuals that we might want to use as examples, I'm sure that we would at some point point out Job because Job was perhaps one of the most righteous men living in his age. And yet, when he saw the Lord, listen to how he responds in Job 42, verses 5 and 6. He says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Now, we can see some of our shortcomings when we compare ourselves with those who are better than we are, but we're never going to see ourselves as we should until we compare ourselves with God. Isaiah was also perhaps one of the most righteous men in his age, and yet he didn't fully realize his condition and the condition of those around him until he stood in the presence of God. He says in verse 5, when he sees the Lord, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. I mean, the sight of God really brings that home. And I think he didn't realize just how hateful his sin really is in the sight of God until that very moment because he also cries out in verse 5, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Now, woe is me, we, we use that term quite a bit today, but it's kind of like the word awesome. We really don't understand what it means, but what he means is, I'm under a curse. Woe means curse, okay? I'm cursed of God because of my sin. And that is what we would all be apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we need to see. That's what we need to realize. Now, again, you know, perhaps an example of this would, would be, you know, sometimes we think maybe we're not so bad. It's kind of like we, we're kind of like a candle that's burning in a dark room that looks like it's bright, at least when its surroundings are dark. But if we take that candle into the full light of the sun, we have a hard time seeing whether it's even still burning. And the same thing is true when we stand in the presence of the Lord. We may not think we're doing so bad, but until we stand before God and then we see ourselves as we should. Now, should we even be thinking along these lines? I mean, is this even a useful road for us to go down? Or should we simply focus on God's love? I mean, that's, that's what we like to do, right? We like to focus on His love. We like to think about His grace covering our sins. And certainly, our sins are covered. Thank the Lord. If we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are removed. They are taken away. But does that mean we shouldn't be concerned then how we live? Well, again, remember what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48. And he said this to his disciples, to his church, in the new, the new covenant that he was bringing. This is instruction for the new covenant. He says, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. For that to take place, we need to know what perfection is. And we need to know what our imperfection is so that we can turn from our imperfection, from our sin, and embrace perfection. We need to be able to see our sins so that we can repent of them. Paul writes in Romans 6, verse 2, How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And then he goes on to say in verses 10 through 14 regarding Jesus and our relationship to Him and what this means regarding our sins, he says this, For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Paul is telling us here that when we came to the Lord Jesus Christ, 
we actually died with him when Jesus died on the cross, and we were buried with him. And having died with him, we also died to sin. Although we realize that sin is still active in us, it's still an imperfection within us, it's an active principle, but we have to deal with it appropriately. We need to consider ourselves dead to sin. But how can we do that if we don't see our sin? And how can we see our sin unless we are looking where we should be looking at God? Now, the reason why we need to see our sin is so that we will repent of our sins, but it has another very important effect upon us, which is something we should never forget, even though we're forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ, even though we're perfect in Him, we still need to be humbled. Now, we're humbled by the greatness of God and by our weakness, by His strength and, and our inability to do what we should do. We're humbled by the great amount of love He has shown us and the weakness of our love. There's so many things that humble us, but one of the things that should is, is the sin that's still within our hearts, the sin we've committed in the past that He's forgiven us of, the sin we're still liable to, that we still fall into today, that is the weakness within us, the sin that we're going to commit in the future, it's important for us to know that those things are there, that we might be humbled by those things so that we might be in a condition by which we can serve the Lord. The Lord tells us in many places that humility is something that He prizes. It's something that He delights in. Arrogance, we've already seen in our meditation, pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverted mouth, I hate. God hates pride, but He prizes humility. David writes in Psalm 51, verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart of God. You will not despise. Is, is that something just for the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, or something for the New Covenant as well? Well, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit but to realize your poverty before the Lord? Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 and 6, You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you at the proper time. I would submit to you that one of the best ways that you can humble yourself, one of the most effective things you can do is to get a clear view of your sin. Jesus actually illustrates this for us in the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector where you have arrogance and humility and how the Lord responds to each. We read in Luke 18 verses 9 through 14, and he, that is Jesus, also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. The world, as you know quite well, is so steeped in the doctrine of self-esteem, so much so that we tend to think it's a sin to see ourselves as falling short or even to talk about sin anymore. But Jesus tells us that we are blessed if we see our shortcomings and confess them before the Lord and humble ourselves before God. It was the tax collector who went to his home justified in God's eyes, not the Pharisee. It's only those who humble themselves that the Lord actually forgives. Now, I want you to see the parallel between what the, the tax collector did and what Isaiah did. 
Isaiah saw the Lord, and when he did, he confessed his sins. Woe is me, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips. This is confession. And then what happens after Isaiah confesses his sin? We read in verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs, and he, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Sounds very similar to what John says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say that we have no sin, think Pharisee, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, think tax collector, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What we see in this case of Isaiah is a wonderful Old Testament picture of the gospel. Isaiah confesses his sins and he is cleansed of his sins. The coal from the altar that touches him is essentially a picture of the application of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ to his sins that cleanses him. You know, if you've never come to the Lord Jesus Christ at all, he says, if you're willing to confess your sins and to turn from them to Jesus and to put your trust in him, he will cleanse you as well. But as long as you justify yourself, you say, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not that bad. I'm like the Pharisee. I'm not like other people. I, my goodness relative to theirs is better in the scales. I come out better. But the thing is, you have to be like God if you're going to enter into heaven. And the only way you can have that kind of righteousness is by trusting in Jesus. But let's not forget, for those of us who have trusted in the Lord Jesus, that it's only those who are humble that the Lord is going to use in his kingdom. And I think it was important that Isaiah be humbled by the sight of himself and the Lord's mercy and grace toward him before he would be fit to go and do what the Lord has called him to do. I think if we were to look in the New Testament and say, which among all the people we read about in the New Testament, of course, from the Lord Jesus, aside from Jesus, did the Lord use most in his kingdom? I hope you would agree with me, it was the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was somebody who was extremely industrious and perhaps one of the, I mean, perhaps the best servant that Jesus ever had. But Paul was also a man who was marked out by humility, humility over his sins. He writes to Timothy towards the end of his life, a statement that I keep coming back to again and again in 1 Timothy 1, verses 15 through 16. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. And let me just draw your attention to the fact that Paul is using the present tense here. He didn't say I was the foremost of all. He wasn't talking about just what he did in the past, but he was saying presently I am still the greatest of sinners. He sees himself as falling short, and I think it's because he had the clearest view of what the Lord was actually like. And then he goes on to say, yet for this reason I found mercy. Isaiah sees his sin, confesses his sin, finds mercy. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. So again, I would ask the question, is it good for us to see our sins? Well, you see, if we don't see them, then we're not going to be able to turn away from them. If we don't see them, we're not going to be humbled by them. And if we're not humbled by them, if we're not humble, then we're not going to be useful to the Lord. As long as we stand in our self-righteousness, God is going to resist us. But He gives grace to those who humble themselves. And the best way to do this is to look at God's perfection, which is what Isaiah did. Now, the last question we need to ask is, how can we do that? I mean, we don't live in Isaiah's day, and we don't really live in a day when the Lord appears to be revealing himself in this way. And even if we did live in his day, there were very few who actually were ever blessed 
with being able to see Him. We can probably count on one hand, maybe two, how many actually saw the Lord in this way. But even though we can't see Him in this way, there's at least two things that we can do by which we can get at least some glimpse of this and one quite fully. Now, first of all, we can obviously read the Bible. More particularly, we can read the law of God. James tells us that the law is like a mirror, that when we look at our faces in it, it can show us our spiritual condition, and it actually will show us warts and all, because whenever we look at the law of God, we will see where we fall short. That's why the Lord gave it to us, to show us our sin, to convince us of sin, to teach us that we need Jesus initially to drive us to Him, but even after having come to Jesus, He gave it to us to show us how we are to live. When Jesus was speaking to His disciples, He taught them the law of God and the Sermon on the Mount. And I think it would be particularly good for us to read that, to read Jesus' exposition, His explanation of the law in that sermon because in it He reminds us that the law goes beyond simply what we do outwardly. It also reaches to what we desire and what we think. Now, let me challenge you, if you haven't read the Sermon on the Mount lately, to read that sermon. And if you can read that sermon and still feel like you come out squeaky clean, then you're not reading it correctly. You don't understand what Jesus is saying. That is the most challenging sermon. And it points out our sin. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. We need to be convicted so that we can turn, so that we can be humbled, okay? But better than that, we can look at the living example of the law in our Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, we can look at the example that the one Isaiah saw seated on the throne gave us when he came down the ladder and became one with us, when he came into the world. We can look at Jesus. Let's not forget the thing that Jesus came to do was to reveal God to us. Now, I know sometimes it's hard to relate those two things. We look at Jesus as a man, and we look at the Son of God seated on His throne, and we say there seems to be a disparity between these two things because that deity was veiled with humanity, and that tends to take a little bit of the edge off of perhaps what we might otherwise see. Jesus did not seem to have the same effect as he did when Isaiah saw him. But let me remind you that there were those occasions when Jesus actually did, as it were, pull back that veil and showed his disciples something of what he really was, such as on the Mount of Transfiguration when they saw him. It struck fear in their hearts. Or when he was on the boat and they woke him up and they said, Master, don't you care? We're perishing. And he gets up and he, he speaks to the wind and the waves and they obey him. And when that happens, they were terrified. We read in Mark 4.41, they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Literally, Mark was saying they feared with a great fear. They were terrified. Now understand, Jesus did not come simply to terrorize us. We shouldn't assume that He appeared to Isaiah as He did to terrorize Him either. But Jesus came to show us our sins so that we might turn away from those sins to Him and be saved. And having been saved, that we might humble ourselves and serve Him in love and humility. It is good to have our sins exposed. It is good to see God's face, not just His face of blessing and grace and mercy in the Lord Jesus, but even His face of holiness because it reminds us of what it is He has called us to be. So may the Lord show us then more of what He is like so that we might, by His grace, turn from all of our sins and humble ourselves and be more useful to Him in His kingdom because that is the true blessing that the Lord holds out to us. 
Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to, um, to show himself to us. And particularly as we come to the table this morning and we're reminded of um, the Lord's holiness in what it costs, as it were, uh, him to pay for our sins. God is holy and God cannot overlook sin.